Section 6 Church of the Deluded Grand Sicarium, Ultramar, during the tempest that engulfed the galaxy, became, at least initially, a bastion of sanity and security for the huddled and fearful servants of the Imperium. As their empire collapsed around them, Ultramar was seen by many as the only option left to the Emperor's people. The Ultramarine successors tried their best to return to Ultramar, to their ancestral home. Some could not abandon their worlds, due to their gene fortresses being located there. However, most managed to convert their chapters into fleet-based chapters. This was the only way to avoid the new Devourer relatively intact, and the only way to travel to Ultramar. In the dark early days of the M42, the small empire within an empire expanded its area of effect, with defenseless, leaderless post-imperial worlds eagerly joining the union of Ultramarines and successors. This expansion was not just a humanitarian one, for the sudden influx of successor chapters necessitated a massive increase in recruitment and training worlds, in addition to a larger infrastructure to accommodate these new arrivals. By the close of M42, almost 3000 Astartes had come to Ultramar, and continued to desperately help fight off the devilish Xenos invaders and heretical monsters, that poured from all directions near constantly. The remnants of the Eagle Warriors and the Genesis chapter, in particular, were instrumental in defending the nearby systems around and within Ultramarian borders. As the first thousand years of the Second Age of Strife plowed onwards, the successors and the Ultramarines became an almost homogeneous mass. As reinforcements for understrength companies came from many where they could find them, be they parent or successor. In general, Ultramarian armies of the period appeared to be strange multicolored groups, with each company often having marines from up to six different chapters within their organization. Genocide was used in Ultramarine recruits, and that same stock used in other chapters, regardless. During the period, any former guardsmen or PDF left within Ultramar, were press ganged into service in these haphazard affairs. Kalga tried to keep to his father's codex, but inevitably, compromises had to be made. They had never encountered a situation like this before. Whatever troops he could muster were pressed into multiple running battles across the subsector. The organization of the worlds would come later, he just needed to hang on to the ones he already had. Quality of life in the Ultramar worlds became much lower than the comfortable conditions of M41. Overcrowding and overpopulation due to refugees made resources scarce, and intense rationing and high taxes were thrust upon the general populace. As memory of the emperor became more distant, and rumors of his death spread, devotion and prayer eventually began to drift towards the protectors of the realm the angels of starts. Cults of personality began to spread across the various worlds of Ultramar, and the marines became figures of divine judgment and awe. No tithe was ever ejected by these ignorant peasants. Even as they died in the street, blind devotion grew in intensity. Some would say despicably, none of the marines discouraged this. Many secretly believed themselves superior than mortal men, and confirmation of this by the laity must have inflated their self-importance to monstrous levels. None more easier than the famous Cato Sicarius. Formerly of the Ultramarine's second company, Sicarius became Centurion Maximal of the defense effort, a rank created by Kalga, who was becoming a very ancient man by this point. Sicarius commanded the offensive war effort, to keep the heretics, horrific Xenos, and rival Imperiums, from tearing down what they had won, whilst Kalga instructed Ajumman, regent of Ultramar and Sicarius rival to look after the administration and regulation of the realm, in cooperation with Kalga himself, by the 455 M42, Kalga had grown restless. He desired for the expansion of Ultramar, to bring sanity back to the galaxy, and remake the Imperium. He saw himself as like unto Gilliman himself, who had pulled the Imperium from chaos back into order following the Horus heresy. He was supremely angry that Sicarius was not expanding, and demanded an explanation. Sicarius tried to explain that he was too pressed simply with keeping the realm secure, and that to expand would be to leave other worlds vulnerable. Nevertheless, Kalga began to accompany Sicarius, and led some expeditions of his own. However, in the people's minds, Sicarius was the true hero, and many began to praise him openly. Sicarius's supporters began to turn his points about security, into ones about racial purity. Ultramar for the Ultramarians began to be heard in the filthy overcrowded cities across the realm. It was in 553 M42, that this mounting distrust between the three men came to a head. A great chaos warlord called Vashnaraman, had gathered a vast army of insane and deluded minions, backed up by demonic engines and a huge fleet of vessels, and had ravaged the Goldian Imperium. 
and the Imperium of the Thorians. Kalga called for a vast force of Ultramar, to sally forth from his realm, and engage this force in battle, for glory and for the Emperor. Sicarius, amazingly, openly dissented, claiming this was a fool's folly. The Ravagers' forces were not on a path to Ultramar. Why risk a war they could not win, which would leave the realm weak? Sicarius was not alone in this, and several vassal chapter masters lobbied Kalga to reconsider. He did not. Thus, a force of 500 marines, with their attendant fleet vessels and human auxiliaries, surged forth to engage the warlord. Notably, Sicarius remained within Ultramar's borders, while Ajumman, keen to curry favor with Kalga, joined the crusade the second largest marine force since the fall of the Imperium as it plunged into the dark, uncharted region beyond the border worlds of Ultramar. It was upon the world of Thrasis, that Kalga engaged the warlord and his forces. A 7 million strong force of frothing madmen and callous mercenaries, faced Kalga's force of 3000, only 500 of which were marines. The battle upon the plain of Cantha was legendary. Kalga used every trick and ploy taught in the Codex, and even some improvisations suggested by Telian and the Dreadnought Uriel. The war was thuggish, brutal and short. Kalga simply could not defeat the huge force which assailed him. It was grim testimony to how far even Ultramar had fallen, that it could not longer defeat a force such as this. Kalga determined that he would be the one to end the war. He fought his way through the press of foul chaotic bodies, Ajumman and the honor guard following in his wake. The chapter master reached to within 14 feet of the skull-helmed Vashnariman. However, tragically, a venomous dart, fired by a sickening depraved elder mercenary, struck the great man in the throat. The elder was said to have told Kalga, as he lay dying, that the bolt had been from a prominent lord of the Shadow Realm. The vile thing had not managed to tell Kalga who it was, as Ajumman struck its head from its shoulders, and dragged Kalga from the fighting. Bloodied and broken, after weeks of fighting, the few survivors of the ill-fated crusade managed to claw their way back to their vessels, and made haste back to Ultramar. However, when Ajumman and the few survivors returned, Ultramar was not how they remembered it. Banners proclaiming Sicarius' ascension to Chapter Master fluttered in the wind, from banner poles across every world. Work was beginning upon statues and memorials to Sicarius. As Ajumman was to learn, Cato had informed the Council of Chapter Masters that Kalga, upon heading for the Crusade, had promised him leadership of Ultramar, knowing that he would die on his Crusade. Sicarius had denounced Kalga as a dreaded Codex Breaker which had become the gravest heresy according to Sicarius, and accused Ajumman of corrupting Kalga's mind. The defense monitors and warships that engaged the returning fleet gave them two options. Surrender Ajumman, and be welcomed back into the fold of Ultramar, or be slain as heretics of the highest order. Heroically, they refused. They were promptly boarded by the vile sycophant Master Titus, of the Genesis chapter, who had become regent in the absence of Ajumman. His forces overwhelmed the Crusaders, and Ajumman was brought back to Macrigan chains. Of Telian and his contingent, no trace was found. Some said he died on Crusade, while the most prevalent theory is that, upon seeing what his Ultramarines had become, he had cast off his armor in disgust, cursing. O oh Imperium, what has man fashioned of ye, before he and his closest acolytes donned simple hooded robes, and vanished into the wilderness beyond Ultramar. Ajumman was executed by Sicarius' own Talisarian blade, before millions of adoring subjects. Over the next millennia, Ultramar became more internally concentrated, and Sicarius' cult of personality grew and grew. Until the chapter master now demanded that he be worshipped as the apparent god he was. The marines became semi-divine angels, and were worshipped alongside him. The sons of Aura were particularly concerned with ensuring worship of Sicarius was regulated tightly. Holy books and histories grew up about him, and myth became fact, and fact became lies, and all the while, Sicarius grew more and more insane. He was the descendant of the god emperor. Thus, as the god emperor was dead, he, Cato Sicarius was god. He had the great obsidian fortress built on Macrag, the titanic structure sprawled across the back of the former polar defense fortress. Tapestries depicting him fighting and killing behemoth single-handedly, or battling the monstrous demon-infested Kalga, began to spring up across the fortress monolithic interior. In M43, Ultramar was renamed Grand Sicarium, in honor of their god. He was king of all space marines, and he demanded they treated him as such. Though powerful beyond measure, he was always paranoid, and the secretive, hollow-eyed special force of chapter serfs, known as idolatrators, moved amongst the squalid societies of Grand Sicarium, from the ash fields of Tarsis, 
to the minds of Colchis. Anyone even so much as voicing a concern about Sicarius was arrested and tortured. His vast throne room within the Obsidian Fortress was said to be lavishly decorated, in all the finest decorations and adornments. His guards flanked every door, and he allowed no one to enter his sanctum, and all business of state was handled by Titus, the miserable and base regent of Grand Sicarium. Upon great pikes lining the citadel, Calgar and Agamemnon's heads were struck upon spikes. It was a stark reminder that Ultramar, and all the glory that came with it, was dead. Only the madness and abomination of Sicarius remain. Section 7 The Crusade of Insanity The Templars on the Rampage The Templars, easily the most pious of the Adeptus Astartes, second only to the Red Hunters and their religious fervor, became something far worse. As their Imperium fell into factionalized and monstrous realms, petty kingdoms and protectorates. The Templars, always distrustful of degenerate navigators and astropaths, seemed justified in their hatred, as the fall of the Astronomicon drove these sickers into destruction. Across the galaxy, the Templars, at a stroke, were hacked into hundreds of separate crusades. Again, this affected the fanatics little, as they were always a divided chapter, and all that changed was that they were forced to remain divided. However, it was the psychological effect upon the Templars, following this calamity, that was far more profound. The various smaller crusades, devoid of their central mission, simply resorted to what they always did. They fought, in the name of the Emperor and Dawn, they suicidally attacked worlds and petty imperiums, regardless of alliances or real imagined heresies, this gained them no friends, as they attacked whoever they could. These isolated crusader forces were, for the most part, ambushed, overwhelmed, or otherwise destroyed, by vengeful and cruel local power magnates. However, the largest force of Templars, 1000 strong, cut a bloody swathe against their foes. This was the Central Templar fleet, led by High Marshal Dorstrus, from his flagship the Eternal Crusader. The Templars traveled from world to world, desperately seeking righteousness. What they saw, on every world, sickened them. Heresy, laxity and impiety were rife, as every human world and Imperium sought to follow their own destinies amongst the callous stars. The grand ideals of the Imperium were forgotten by all, save, of course, the Templars. The more they saw, the more their own insane ideologies seemed to make sense, and the more warped their worldview became. Dostress moved from world to world, traveling by short warp jumps, in an increasingly unmappable galaxy. His Templars would offer two options to human colonies Ray convert to the Imperial Faith, or be totally destroyed. To Xenos, no option was given, and they were massacred wherever the Templars found them. Thus, the Black Templars invaded world after world, recruiting those insane or desperate enough, and putting the rest of the flame in the sword. Cities were torched, or cleansed by nuclear fire. Sword brethren and wild-eyed initiates moved amongst the fearful enemy, singing delirious hymns, all the while crying with glee, as they maimed and crushed and burned, all in the Emperor's name. As they moved slowly across the already war-torn and brutalized galaxy, the zealous and insane detritus of human society, gibbering priests, flagellating cultists and rogue clergy attached themselves to the Templar's rapidly expanding ragtag fleet. As more and more religious fanatics merged with the fleets, chanting their devotional hymns throughout he fleet. The Templars began to move more and more to believing the Emperor was indeed God made manifest, and the loss of the Astronomicon was merely the final sign, the rallying call of the Templars. They were to purge the galaxy clean, and only then, in his mercy, the Emperor could return. Some of the Sisters of Battle, stranded on remote worlds, were incorporated into this crusade, and found themselves caught up in the self-perpetuating religious psychosis the rest of the crusade found itself in. Hundreds of rogue marines from various free companies tagged alongside the rambling, murderous crusade, along with plenty of former pirates and rogues, and their attendant private armies. While openly they gibbered praises to the emperor like everyone else in the crusade, these malcontents and deceitful mercenaries and murderers all secretly knew why they fought. Just for the sheer murderous joy of it, and the simple fact that they could. Some of the marines were even actually traitors, who just used the religious motives of the crusade to justify their joining in. For instance, it was noted that several marines within the crusade may have, in fact, been Night Lord Chaos Space Marines though this couldn't be confirmed. Fighting with the Templars simply because the two forces had similar motives in mind destruction and fear. The crusade swelled to almost 2000 astartes, millions of raving human fanatics and semi-elite soldiery, as well as thousands of vessels. 
It was the second greatest concentration of marines in the galaxy during this period. Despite this, the crusade could never reunite the Imperium, or try to bring order to the relentless anarchy. No, because the Templars had believed their own rhetoric. They were not on a crusade of redemption, but one of punishment, and pain. They blundered from system to system, near aimlessly, attacking and brutalizing whoever they came across. Planets were ransacked, their people put to death or simply beaten until they could fight no more. This relentless process of murder and prayer would have continued indefinitely, one would assume, as the Templar's crusade grew in numbers every time a world was ransacked. This was to change when they encountered, high in the galactic north, the Eastern Chaos Imperium, led by the legendary Huron Blackheart. Section 8 ravages and rogues piracy in the second age of strife. As with any major disaster, the collapse of the Imperium was exploited by the scum and dishonorable filth of the universe, which used up from the widening cracks in Imperial authority. Like wriggling maggots crawling free of a corpse. With no centralized Imperial authority, and with a non-existent interstellar communication system, any Imperial battle fleets or sector fleets which survived the initial hellstorm of the new devourer, were utterly lost and aimless in this new, shattered galaxy. All warp routes were rendered useless, and all warp charts and mapping of the universe instantly became out of date. The universe became a bigger, more incomprehensible place. Not only this, but the few coherent battle fleets could only travel as fast as the short warp transit systems on both their vessels would allow. The main body of the navigator houses were destroyed when terror was overrun by demons. And many more were simply driven utterly insane by the sudden surge in chaotic activity in the dreadful wake of the collapse. Thus, without any opposition the criminal, and sometimes heretical, scum of the universe sprang up in greater numbers than ever before. Disorientated or lost merchant fleets were ransacked, their people either butchered or brutalized in a variety of interesting and, above all, nasty ways. Wolf packs, composed of rogue frigates and other human detritus, blockaded whole systems, holding their people for ransom. Other, more insane or reckless pirates, chased convoys and transports for many light years, just for the thrill of the hunt. It was said this age of strife was a veritable paradise for the impious and the criminal. Throughout this period, there were several general varieties of raiding forces operating at any given time across the galaxy, which we shall detail here. Of course, these categories are by no means exclusive, such as the ragtag nature of pirate and ravager's fleets, that often they are composed of mixtures of several different kinds of raider, each sharing the similar goals of savagery, plunder and profit. One the Wolf Packs. Rogue frigate captains, disgruntled former merchants, political dissidents turned profiteering privateers and just plain pirates. These are not a new phenomenon, and were certainly present throughout the 41st millennium, as well as the 51st. Yet, it was the scale of these piratical groups which increased across the second age of strife. They became bolder and more vicious, picking off larger targets who, stripped of their protectors, were relatively easy prey for these bands of renegades. Sometimes these packs of predators and scavengers would be founded by dissident ex-navy personnel, other times they would be formed by ambitious local crime lords, who, through bribery, murder and betrayal, managed to gain enough power and resources to commandeer, or commission to be built for them, several starships. These would be outfitted with whatever weapons and crew they could scrounge, be they mercenary scum, thieves, or murderers, and from simple missile pods and projectile cannons to stolen plasma batteries or lance emplacements. Such cobbled together forces would be no problem for a fully equipped military fleet. Unfortunately, none were forthcoming to challenge these cowardly villains. One prominent example of this sort of fleet was the fleet of Captain Testando Marcus. During a failed warp transit, during M42, this dauntless class light cruiser captain found himself alone, his cruiser lost amid the sea of stars. The captain was a greedy man, and cared little for the Imperium while he was within it. Now he and his crew were alone, his greed turned to open descent. He used his ship's substantial offensive power, to terrify isolated worlds into submission, or used his bloodthirsty crew to board ships, or invade particularly primitive worlds. Plundering them of anything of value, raping anyone they chose to, and generally being unpleasant. His crew were not uniformly greedy and malicious, though those honorable souls on board were soon double-crossed or betrayed by their more unscrupulous shipmates. Marcus kept order through the promise of bounty and rewards, and a system of violent meritocracy prevailed on board. Soon, 
As word spread of the sharks' vessel was renamed thusly criminal successes, a small following of captured vessels, from frigates to crudely home-built converted cargo freighters, tagged alongside the unusually powerful pirate vessel. In general, his Wolf Pack, like most of this sort, stayed around a single system or local net of systems that they had visited before, not daring to risk warping off into unknown areas. To the Corsairs. Easily the rarest form of pirate abroad in the galaxy during this period. These neomythic forces consist of those scant few elder, locked on the path of the outcast, who lost everything. Their craft worlds were either dead, or imprisoned within the inner web. These outcasts found their race was gone, there would never, ever be any redemption for them. Thus, with great wrath and hatred, they turned upon the perceived causes of their misery humanity being one of them. The Elder, whose race had become a myth to almost all beings in the galaxy, darted between the various overlapping jurisdictions of the countless petty empires of the galaxy, murdering and stealing, howling curses through lyrical throats. They never left a trace of their presence. Only bodies. Their overly emotional minds turned to dark thoughts, which they could not escape from. Some said Ariel the Mad led them, but no one can be sure. Indeed, no one is sure these Corsairs exist at all. Of course, something is killing the isolated human colonies, and stealing supplies from anyone they can. 3 The Darkling's Dark Elder. Little info available at this time. 4 The Scavengers. Some pirate fleets seem to consist of scratch-built, cobbled together starships, built from ruins and wrecks, but repaired. Some say these fleets are remnants of the fabled pure orcs. However, no one takes those claims seriously. Everyone knew what happened to the orcs. Thus, these vessels were not orcish in design. Yet, some great cunning must have built these crude wonders. Encounters with these vessels, and their piratical crews, gives us better clues. Mutants. Every single encounter was orchestrated, performed, and carried out by mutants. These deformed and hideous creatures, hiding their humps, bestial tails and wasting limbs beneath thick robes and clunky respirator equipment, boarded vulnerable vessels, using flamers, stub guns and other, homemade weapons, stealing whatever they needed. They simply called themselves the scavenge. It is thought that these disparate fleets, operating nearby the Florian system, in the Segmentum Pacificus, are said to have a base within that region, possibly even a captured industrial world. Legends tell of the scavenger, a young boy, cursed by a dreadful wasting affliction, making him feeble and ugly. The young boy was driven into the underhive of his world, by the hateful normals of society. He found a loving family amongst the mutant slave population of the world, who were all hunched, twisted monsters, but who loved him as one of their own. This boy was, by any accounts, a savant and genius, of the most dangerous variety. He was an innovator. He swiftly became leader of the underground mutant coven, and got them to steal machinery from the surface, to bring to him. They did so, and in the dark, he began to create. No one knows the end of the tale, but soon after, the scavenge became a notoriously dangerous pirate faction, using whatever machinery they could to devise ever more ingenious and lethal technologies. Section 9 The Unseen Wars. The 51st millennium is a period of immense distrust and mutual loathing. Man turned upon man, as he is depressingly wont to do throughout history, and the petty imperiums, Xenos conglomerates, and various other interstellar nations and powers, closed off their borders in deathly fear of taint. Interstellar traffic became isolated into pockets, focused around the grim little clusters of systems carved out by their ruthless feudal masters. Espionage, assassinations and spying missions became far more common than in any period previously. Many mundane spies, from millions of worlds, sauntered undetected upon rival enemy soil, watching, interfered and occasionally, murdering, all to advance the agendas of their individual employers. Of course, like a viper amongst grass snakes, these relatively harmless snoops were far from the only unseen forces, plying their deadly and deceitful trades across the harsh galaxy. On the dark day of the Emperor's death, survivors claim a series of most mysterious events occurred. It was claimed that the custodians were abroad in terrace streets. All of them, no explanation was given, and any Arbites patrols which challenged them were instantly swatted aside. Valda himself led the march, his eyes aflame with sorrow, mixed with mute fury. Nobody knew why they moved through the city, until they entered the grounds of the Assassinorum temples, supposedly hidden from all, the custodies found it instantly, and, with great fury, they battered down the doors. Upon doing so, 
They found each and every temple empty. Well, not quite empty. The Grand Master, obviously expecting guests, had left almost a thousand diversa assassins behind. The battle was fierce and brutal. Many custodes died, as did Aversa. Eventually, the fight spilled out into the pilgrim choked streets. Though only a few hundred Aversa were left, they used the swelling crowds to their advantage, attacking the golden giants while bogged down amongst millions of terrified, screaming pilgrims. However, the custodes, with great wrath and fury, slew all the Aversas, which blew up all around, collapsing buildings and cratering roads. As thousands of men and women suddenly died in these biological detonations. Instead of returning to the palace, these apparently heretical custodes requisitioned transports, and made all speed to Titan. It was said their leader had tears in his eyes, mouthing the words absolution. By the time various inquisitors had managed to wrangle a large enough force of Imperial Guard, Terran PDF Bio Supermen, Imperial Fists, and Arbites, and charged into the palace to defend the now defenseless Emperor. However, it was too late. The throne had failed, the Emperor was dead, and a tide of pure warpish nightmares was pouring forth. The Inquisitors and Fists tried their best, but soon the entire palace was overrun, and soon after, the whole world. Though the rest of the Fists of World who we will discuss later never saw the battle, it was said the last living beings on Terra were the Imperial Fists, who fought the thick tide of demons. Until the twisted demon flesh literally buried them, and even then, beneath the seething tide of filth, rumbling detonation signaled the fists still lived below, at least for a few defiant hours after being overwhelmed. These witness accounts raise serious questions. Why did the custodians flee? Or were they ordered to? If so, what had the emperor seen? Why did the custodes assault the assassin temples so viciously? Where was the Grand Master and his disciples? And, most importantly, what happened to the Emperor? Of these questions, only a few have potential answers. The question of the Assassinorum is one such question. The officio seemed to vanish in the first 500 years of M42. However, eventually, brief glimpses of black-garbed beings cropped up, across every Imperium, from the Western Chaos Imperium, to the ash fields of the Imperium of the White-Eyed Devils. Some were obviously rogue assassins, randomly striking at centers of government, because they had no orders, and had no idea how to integrate into normal society. These twisted, delusional beings believed that the natural state of affairs of planets was to have no governors or officials. They had been raised since childhood to believe that slaying these targets was the height of piety. Hence, since governors were the most common target in their past lives, these childlike rogues continued to slay the governors of their worlds. In one extreme case, one Calidus assassin was said to have killed every governor of the industrial world Gox, for 40 years. Every time a replacement inherited the title, the delusional assassin, believing all governors to be wrong, killed each and every one, each time in a different way and in a different guise. Eventually, the desperate government of the world hired Demiurg mercenaries, to scan for polymorph traces. The trail led to a rundown Hab district. To be sure of execution. The whole hab complex was burned down, the attacks stopped. Of course, others seemed to be much more sinisterly organized. Strategic targets were struck. Merchants were killed, or their families intimidated. These scared groups of traders and petty profiteers often ended up allying together for protection, and used their resources to hire forces from various imperiums to protect them from assassins. This led, in some remote regions, to imperiums beginning to offer conditional non-aggression pacts with each other. Of course, these were very fragile things, and often fell apart at the slightest provocation. However, it showed that the assassins, perhaps consciously or intentionally, were trying to knit the Imperium back together. Not that the petty warlords appreciated this, as any captured assassins were tortured, interrogated, and burned alive. Those Calidus, Vindicare, and Cullius assassins caught would only say one word to their captors, before being executed. Heracles, in contrast, Throughout the 51st millennium, as if the constant brutality, wars and general paranoia did not make the period miserable enough, several factions of the dreaded Alpha Legion began to spring up once more. Of course, no marines were ever actually seen, only the crude painted Hydra symbols left at the scenes of carnage they left in their wake. Bombs were planted, pro-alliance officials butchered or brutally maimed. In some cases, important defensive secrets of several Imperiums were sold by mysterious Alpha Legion spies, to rival Imperiums or Xenos Empires. 
who promptly use this knowledge to then destroy their foes, out of nothing more than bloody minded spite. Everywhere alliances were induced by the officio assassinorum, so they were shattered by the even more mysterious alpha legions agents. No one truly knows how many alpha legionnaires died during the first thousand years of the M42, but most agree, very few survived the new devourer. Thus, the remaining alpha legion became far, far more devious. Legion cells were so excellently hidden, they weren't uncovered until the bombs or whatever attack planned, went off. It is suspected many of their servants are not even astarts, and work amongst the other citizens of the galaxy, sowing discord discreetly. However, it was clear the two organizations, Assassins and Alpha Legion, were at war. Sometimes this was political, sometimes it became direct, with brutally quiet street brawls and backstreet executions being the main battleground betwixt the two forces. Both sides had little idea of what the purpose of the war was, but in general, the war was kept as a secret, hidden war. The Unseen War, fought beneath the feet of humanity. As war raged between vast armies and squalid empires, so too did each set of spies and assassins try to outsmart or outmaneuver the other. Due to the secrecy of the conflict, little is known about either side. It is known that several robed marines may be connected to the Alpha Legion, one going by the title The Voice Answered, a mysterious fellow, wielding two pistols, but no other weapons. Once, it was said he wielded a sword, but evidently no longer. Of course, this war of subterfuge and murder, was not as simple as a mere fight between assassin and terrorist. Several other factions muddied the waters. A cabal of mysterious beings was known to be in contact with both sides, and engaged in a strange covert war of their own. The mythical bendies became more prevalent, in particular on board Adeptus Mechanicus vessels, often murdering suspected dragon cultists and satanists in their beds, and dragging them off into the darkness. These strange beings were in constant contact with the Cabal, and the assassins it is claimed. Unforgiven, the last few hundred surviving Dark Angels and successors, fought guerrilla wars against any suspected Legion or Chaos strongholds across the galaxy. Their numbers too small and too scattered now to fight true scale wars. It is known they in particular hated the hooded marines aiding the Legion, and often made special effort in seeking out these marines, and killing them painfully. Telian and his Grey Cloaks were almost folk heroes amongst post-imperial citizens across the southeastern Ultima Segmentum. They came to a world, unseen, and destroyed corrupt rulers or criminally hateful villains, before disappearing into the void once more. Some claimed them to be a myth, to cover the tracks of unruly peasants, but some suspected otherwise. Thus, we can see, the galaxy churned with war, across every world, at every level. No one was safe from the bone crushing agony of living in the second age of strife. Section 10 The New Devourer, the Great Devourer, the Dread Star Locust, had made massive inroads into the galaxy, even by M41, snatching whole clusters of worlds in its billions of jaws, digesting them, even as their hopeless defenders screamed defiance. Many were the attempts by a one inquisitor cryptman, to slay the foul swarm, which flooded from beyond the void betwixt galaxies, viruses, firestorms, plague bombs, exterminators. All these devious and hateful ploys failed, the beast was too adaptive, too fiercely unstoppable. At last, in the closing decades of the 41st millennium, that he employed his final, lasting gambit, the Tyranids, that great plague, was turned towards the only race in the galaxy as hopelessly virulent as themselves the Orcs. Jenna Steelers were seeded upon the surfaces of the Octavian Overfiend's many worlds, drawing the Great Devourer, like a moth to a blazing furnace. The war was unsinkable. As the Tyranids flooded the worlds with warriors, the Orcs fought all the fiercer, growing stronger in the crucible of war, and drawing more of their number to them, via the unseen psychic force all Orcs shared. As the numbers swelled, the Tyranids feasted upon this superior biomass, and they too grew strong from the continuing war. Both sides drove the other to ever greater feats, and ever increasing numbers. The worlds of the Arctavius became twisted hells, orc spores and machinery coiling around and competing, with vast spires of bone and chitin, and creeping vines of semi-organic malice. As the death mounted, the bodies coated the worlds, expanding the vast surface of each to unprecedented sizes. Worlds collapsed under the pressure of so many bodies and structures, but even the collapsing boulder fields were knitted together by slimy tendrils, and warring machinery. Rogues and hulks warped in from across the galaxy, accompanied by fleets of countless orcs. For a brief moment, things seemed to be improving in the universe. 
Orc held worlds across the galaxy suddenly began to depopulate, as almost every orcoid in existence, plowed into the churning maelstrom of the Arctavius Empire. The Imperium and other aliens moved into these vacant worlds, and it seemed as if perhaps the Imperium was not doomed after all, their vain hope was misplaced. For, as Tyranid and Orc came together in this war, each of these rival ecosystems, so virulent and profound in their terraforming abilities, began to subvert one another, at the biological level. Orc spores mutated, to infest Tyranids, Tyranids infested Orcs with gene stealer eggs and Tyrannic lice. Tyranid spores battled Orc spores, just as Carnifexes and Biotitans battled Gargants and Stompus, in the epic, never-ending war. Nobody knows for sure when it came about, but the new Devourer was swift to action. It crafted a species, born of Tyranid and Orc, but truly of neither, which turned upon the Orcs and Tyranids, stripping them of their biomass, to create their own hive wag. The creatures created seemed to be muscular, large and covered in foul appendages and weapons. Hive ships, coated in Orcoid machinery, fused with Orcish biology, and merged with Tyranid hyper-evolution and biomorphs, spread from the Octavius system. The orcs were outmatched by this new force. The new devourer's troops were vast things, taller than almost all orcs, faster than all orcs. The spore reproduction of the orcs was subverted, and these monsters reproduced at a scarily swift race, with monsters sprouting up from the ground, within hours of being seeded from each new devourer beast. Each beast could produce a thousand offspring within a day, each battle ready on that same day. The regenerative ability of Tyranids and Orcs was also heightened and twisted beyond comprehension, until wounds were healing. Even before the blade or weapon causing the wound have even finished wounding the fiends. They could not be killed, they could not be stopped. The inherent Orcoid knowledge of technology allowed them to merge technology with biotechnology, creating semi-mechanical monsters beyond the wildest nightmares of even the most mental of mech boys. Similarly, the Tyranids could not defeat the new devourer. Even when a high fleet devoured specimens of the new devourer, the high vessel which absorbed the biomass, would become corrupted by the new devourer, and become part of this burgeoning new terror's psychic web. The hive mind, like a bear pulling its paw from the fire, withdrew its surviving fleets from the Milky Way. The vast majority of the Tyranid race lay beyond the galaxy. However, on some level, the titanic consciousness of the hive mind realized it could not eat whatever horrendous thing had been born in our galaxy. Thus, the Tyranids turned from this galaxy, and looked to other galaxies, teeming with life. The Orcs, unable to ever feel fear or dread, merely decided to go down fighting. For, it was the only Orky thing left to do. Was Daka launched a surprise attack, deep into the heart of the new Devourer, charging from his semi-complete warp superhighway. He led a glorious charge, leading almost a million trillion Orcs in the largest battle in the history of the entire galaxy. They struck right at the rotten heart of the new Devara's physical and psychic web. A trillion roaring boys, which shuddered the air, and melted brass. Such was the volume and intensity. Gargants and Stompers fired constantly, the air literally colored orange by constant weapons fire and discharge. Rockets and bombs were dropped in their billions, vaporizing everything they struck. Cruisers and hulks rammed new Devara hive ships, their pilots howling wag forever, before charging across their own ships to fist fight their foes in space itself. It was not enough. The orcs couldn't kill the new devourer. Nothing truly could. The new devourer murdered each and every orc that attacked it, before it spread out, and picked off every other orc, who nevertheless fought on, laughing with glee as they fought the new devourer. However, it was known that the orcs hated this foe, calling them cheetahs and orid grow lads. In contrast, the new devourer had no language for their foe, beyond the endless. Piercing bellow of the hyperfiends the most commonly seen foot soldier beast of the new devourer. The orcs, howling and defiant, died almost to an orc. Only one warag seemed to survive the onslaught, led by an orc with a bolt or wound to its head. It claimed it had heard Wyagras glare, a being the warbus claimed was the dad of Gork and Mork. This apparent god, told the orc leader to kick his way into the puny elder web place and wait for more instructions. Nobody knows what happened to this warag. Of course, the new Devara did not stop with the Orcs. In the first few centuries of the 42nd millennium, this foul plague swept across the entire galaxy, driven by a corrupted kind of Wyarg field, and the overall hive imperative of the new Devara's synapse web. Imperial blockades were useless. TAU negotiators were slain. Whole naval incursions were swatted aside. Space marine chapters were swallowed whole, by titanic fleets of biomechanical hive ships. 
At least half of the Elder Craft worlds were crushed and sucked dry, their fleets, their memories, their hopes, all quashed. Entire alien civilizations were eaten or torn apart, and millions of worlds were utterly, utterly purged. It was estimated that almost half of all life in the galaxy died in those few hundred years. The only defense against the new devourer was to flee it, or dodge it. The only thing it did not do better than the Tyranids, was the shadow in the warp. It didn't have one. Worlds got plenty of warning, and fleets could indeed mobilize quickly enough. Though it was easier to evade, it was nevertheless unstoppable. Indeed, the history of the Second Age of Strife may have ended there, if something beyond our galaxy hadn't distracted the new devourer. Something was happening, far from the Milky Way, and the new devourer's keen psychic sense detected it. Something shifted, deep in the beyond, the new devourer left the galaxy entirely, within the space of three years, leaving nothing of themselves behind, they went to fight something greater, something different. Again, whatever it was or is, is a complete mystery to the denizens of this galaxy. The only clue came from an astrologer, living within the Aphelian Imperium. She turned her eye lenses towards the distant galaxy, nicknamed Arcus Vosh, after her father. She noted how, slowly, even as she watched, the light of that galaxy went dim. As of yet, no scholar, from any race, can explain this. In fact, most do not wish to. Of course, what they thought is irrelevant to us, because it simply meant that the galaxy, once more, had just managed to survive total annihilation. In this post devourer galaxy though, as we can see from previous sections, was a realm gutted, wounded and diseased. The galaxy became a festering wound of civil war, brutality, murder, genocide, ignorance and hatred. It existed only to cause misery, as every race made every other race suffer. Life was horrendously horrific in those times. But, at least, it was indeed life. In a universe as cruel as this one, one must be thankful for small mercies, no matter how bitter. If you haven't already check out my Redbubble portfolio, you might just find something you like. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services! It's time to stop!